All right, it looks like it's one o'clock, but um, I might give it another minute or so just to make sure we have our committee members as panelists. All right, let's begin. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Josh Sun with the Department of Planning and Development. Welcome to the February 9th, 2022 meeting of the Committee on Design. Uh, first, some housekeeping. Please be advised that this meeting is being recorded and live streamed to the DPD's YouTube page. If you are part of an applicant team presenting today, please hit the raise hand button on Zoom and we will make you a Zoom panelist. All right, now back to business. Uh, to our esteemed committee, thank you for volunteering your time to be a part of this advisory group. To the members of the public who are joining us, what you will see today and at future Committee on Design meetings are projects currently under review by DPD staff. The committee is a voluntary advisory body of design professionals that provide their expertise on design issues. The committee is not a substitute for plan commission and it is not a forum for public debate, nor is the advice of the committee legally binding. It is the hope that today's discourse will lead to recommendations that will elevate the design excellence of the city of Chicago. These recommendations will be forwarded to DPD staff for consideration as they review the projects for plan commission and subsequent approvals. I will now continue on to roll call. Please state present or here if you are in attendance. Catherine Baker. Here. Jackie Ku. Here. Andre Brumfeld. Philip Enquist. Andre Brumfeld is present. Philip Enquist. Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Nini Gang. Present. Thank you. Amanda Williams. Eleanor Gorski. Uh, Maria Villalobos. Present. Thank you. And Leon Walker. Good afternoon here.
And we also have two uh, cohort B members joining us uh, since we do have two vacancies. Uh, Reed Kroloff. Here. You and Juan Moreno. Present. Fantastic. Okay. All right. To members of the public, you are welcome to begin dropping comments and questions into the Q&A box. Committee members are invited to review this information during and after each presentation and incorporate the comments into the discussion. We will not be reviewing questions or comments from the public individually. To the applicant teams, please clearly state your name and your relation to the project prior to speaking. You have 30 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes to present your proposal. Committee members, please hold your comments and questions until after each presentation. We will now move to the first item on the agenda. And Emily, feel free to pull up the slides if you want and I'll go ahead and go through the summary. Located at 1200 South Jean-Baptiste Point du Sable Lakeshore Drive, the Shed Aquarium located in the fourth ward. The applicant proposes to improve function, accessibility, and public space at the shed while preserving significant characteristics of the institution. A circular trellis will define an arrival location to complement the commissioned fountain man with fish while anchoring an entry and ticket pavilion. Renovations will be compliant with the Secretary of Interior standards to maintain the opportunity to secure future state funding. A new landscaping plan will provide programming for visitors to play, rest, and engage in new sustainable gardens. The North Terrace will be replaced with stone salvaged from the existing building and widened by 10 feet. Additional work to the terrace will include the construction of a basement to house life support equipment required for the improved large animal habitats. A new pavilion on the lakeside terrace will include a roof deck at the same level as the North Terrace. Please proceed with the presentation and state your name prior to speaking. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Megan Curran. I'm the Chief Marketing and Experience Officer at Shed Aquarium. And I'm going to say just a few words to introduce our broader Centennial Commitment Project before turning it over to Joe Valerio, our architect, and then Brad McCauley from Site Design. Um, on the next slide, I can start with a brief introduction. Our Centennial Commitment at Shed Aquarium represents our commitment looking toward our 100th anniversary. It's a $500 million project that is part improvement of our physical facility, but also more than half of it is a large commitment programmatically to updating and increasing our program on site at the aquarium, out in the community and digitally um, to reach people anywhere they would like to reach the aquarium. This commitment is thought to be for people for communities and for animals, and is focused on our most historic galleries within the aquarium, the spaces that opened in 1930 when we first opened. We have 2 million guests every year at the aquarium. We are the most attended cultural ticketed attraction in Chicago, and we are compelled to continue to grow. We are driven by three crises that our planet is currently facing the climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis, and an increasing lack of connectivity to nature. We can and we must make the aquarium spaces work harder and be more relevant to all of our guests and to our communities. And this commitment is our effort to drive us into a thriving future for our planet. On the next slide, I wanna talk about the fact, oh, I'm sorry, go back one slide. Um, I'll start by introducing our team. Um, we have surrounded ourselves for the last five years of planning with the best and brightest experts we could find. Presenting with me today, Joe Valerio from Valerio DeWalt Train, Brad McCauley from Site Design, Bridget O'Keefe is here from Desmond and Amon, as is Heather Gleason as our landowner, the Park District. I also have several colleagues online with us as panelists for the Q&A session, should we need to call on them. Those include from Shed Leadership, Bridget Coughlin, our president and CEO is here, as well as Andrea Rogers from External Affairs and Marketing, and Sarah Hiesel from our Design and Exhibits Department. 
Also on the line is Sherry Andrews from Valerio DeWalt Train and Erica Ruggiero from McGuire, Igleski and Associates, as well as Eva Weir from Jones Lang and LaSalle, who is our program manager. On the next slide, I'll speak briefly to the goals of our project, where we are centering on design excellence and really making sure that that design excellence focuses on how function, both for our guests and for the animals, meets accessibility. Improving an accessible entrance that was a rudimentary cutout of our building and turning it into something generous and wonderful, while also employing universal design throughout the aquarium to ensure that all guests can enjoy their experience from the moment they arrive in our gardens on campus. Preservation of our historic building, making sure that we preserve and in many cases honor our history, opening up focus on some of the beautiful architectural details, as well as improving access to our public spaces, making them more participatory, more permeable, adding nature-based experiences and highlighting our space on the lakefront and making it available to everyone who comes to museum campus. We will elevate our learning experiences and bring them centrally into the aquarium experience while also updating our animal habitats and meeting modern standards of animal care. Um, all of these things must be balanced for our design excellence to thrive in this plan. And our partners have done an exceptional job. I'm gonna, on the next slide, briefly introduce today what represents a small portion of the $500 million project, but all our important enablers to a modernized aquarium exhibit inside our doors. Um, the first is that we will enhance our existing accessible entrance. Um, kind of on the bottom angle of the map, you can see the circular space that is our current accessible entrance. And we will make needed enhancements to make that a space that is truly welcoming and um, creates a sense of belonging and better circulation for all who attend. You may think of the aquarium as a place that has lines and that has um, capacity challenges. And I'm really proud over the last five years that through a variety of strategies, we have essentially eliminated those lines. We no longer need to worry about how to accommodate a long line on campus. We instead need to take the vast majority of our guests who arrive with tickets allocated by hourly time slots and get them in as effectively as possible at this entrance. We also must rebuild our North Terrace. It is crumbling and in disrepair. And in doing that, as you heard in the introduction, we will also add a basement level below to add some new modern um, animal welfare for some of our new exhibit experiences. And finally, we have a proposal to enclose our Lakeside Terrace, which will allow needed added seating for our school groups. We're inordinately proud of this project and excited about it and really thrilled to share it with you and to hear your input today. And with that, I'll turn it over to Joe Valerio. Your mute button, Joe. Sorry, uh, this is Joe Valerio. And could we go back to the previous slide for a second? I, I wanted to make sure the committee members understood a few things about the previous editions. The Oceanarium was the first major addition uh, to the aquarium in the late 80s. Um, notice that uh, the radiating lines from the Oceanarium all uh, converge on the center of the rotunda in the historic building. Uh, when wild, the Wild Reef building was added to the south, um, the, uh, again, the, um, the radiating lines generating that form uh, converge on the center of the rotunda and the curve is a radius uh, 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 for, or an arc again centered on the rotunda. What, what we saw here was uh, a kind of respect that the uh, other uh, two architects of those additions had for the historic building and so when we considered uh, 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 creating an a enhanced ac accessible entrance, one of the key decisions was to orient that space uh, to the center point of the rotunda uh, and also define, as you can see in this plan, an exterior courtyard uh, that would create a sense of place, a sense of arrival. 
And I think uh, with those ideas in hand, uh, let's go on to the next slide, which um, actually um, in uh, the Department of Planning's introduction, they basically went through all these points. So in, in the interest- May I ask a question? I'm sorry, Joe, sure. this is Eleanor Gorski. Can we go back to that slide? I just wanna make sure I understand where the two additions are. I know we're limited in Zoom here. Of course, I know the Oceanarium is on the east side, but the, the reef addition, is that uh, directly south of the rotunda? Is that yeah. where that square is? It's directly That's south uh, of the rotunda. And basically that addition, uh, just to be clear, um, replaced the existing south terrace um, at the same elevation, but the shape was revised in order to enclose and create the wild reef exhibit, which is under that that terrace. Okay. And what, what date was that done? Uh, that was completed approximately 2000. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so now, <laughs> because this was basically read uh, during the, uh, the introduction, uh, in the interest of time, why don't we go on to the next slide? So one of the things that we've been uh, uh, doing uh, in the last uh, a uh, couple of months is we've been meeting with a variety of uh, interest groups uh, and we've asked them to sort of comment on their feelings about our design, uh, giving us their own ideas. Uh, and we're hoping that today we get some additional feedback from the committee that can help inform uh, our design as we move forward. We do have a, a couple of additional meetings which we need to complete. Uh, which will be done um, uh, shortly. In fact, actually, I just realized the Near South Planning Board, we met with them uh, about a week ago. So if we go on to the next slide, um, the Chicago Park District, and Heather Gleason is here representing the Park District, uh, really uh, sent us a, a letter which uh, uh, really complimented us on our whole strategy, uh, both in terms of uh, maintaining um, the open space around the uh, entrance to the aquarium, uh, in fact, all around the site, which is within our property lines, um, made a few suggestions, but it was really uh, a full-throated endorsement of our approach. Um, I won't read the individual comments, but um, I think you can sense from uh, reading these uh, how uh, favorable this review was. If we go on to the next couple of slides, and I'm not gonna go into um, detail on the comments that we received, but we were really thrilled to find that a number of the groups uh, really thought that what we were doing was very favorable. Um, just two days ago, we got a letter from uh, Landmarks Illinois, and I'm quoting um, from a letter written by the direct, their director of Ad advocacy. I am writing to express support for the proposed renovation and addition plans developed for the Shedd Aquarium. Landmarks Illinois endorses the Shedd Aquarium's commitment to enhance accessibility to this extraordinary historic building and its exhibits. Um, there were some comments that suggested changes to our design. Um, interestingly, uh, uh, and not surprisingly, uh, most of those comments dealt with reducing the size of the additions we were making to the building. And I hope in this presentation um, that we're uh, uh, going to, uh, that we're in the middle of right now, that um, we can explain why uh, we've designed what we, we've, we've designed, uh, the thinking behind it. And basically everything is related to, in our minds, first design excellence, second, preservation, and third function. Um, so let's uh, go on. So um, just to review the, um, the uh, planning and design guidelines that um, uh, we've been focused on, these include Department of Planning and Development's new design excellence principles, uh, the Grant Park Framework Plan, which is um, uh, uh, a, a park district uh, initiative. Uh, of course, the Central Area Plan, 
and then the central air, uh, the Chicago Central Area Action Plan. And then finally, of significant importance, um, is the Secretary of Interior standards for rehabilitation of a, a building that is on the National Registry of Historic Places. Next. Um, uh, Megan commented on the team that has been assembled. Um, this includes local consultants such as ourselves, but also national consultants such as Think for the exhibit design, Orca, which is a widely respected circulation consultant that has uh, supported uh, changes to over 50 museums in the United States. And then finally, another important partner is Iconograph, who are wayfinding consultants who we've worked with uh, hand in hand on the development of the design of the entry and interior changes. Next. So just to orient you, um, I'm sure everyone on the, um, on the committee is aware of the location of the shed. Um, I would point out a few uh, important uh, things about the, the overall plan of the museum campus. The majority of the parking is located in um, the Soldier Field parking structure. Uh, the exit from that structure is uh, almost a quarter mile from the Shed Aquarium. There is a small parking area just southeast of the Field Museum. Um, it, it has very limited capacity. And then there's the uh, surface parking area adjacent to the Adler Planetarium. Um, and then of course, uh, there are there is the, the L stops, which are on Roosevelt Road, which are a considerable distance from the museum campus. Um, and if we go to the next slide, which is a more detailed view, um, you can see that you can see the small parking area southeast of the Field Museum at the bottom of the image. You can see the CTA stop on Solidarity Drive. Um, and um, you can also see the purple or, or uh, uh, red line is basically the lease boundaries uh, of our lease with the park district. So all of our improvements uh, need to be located within that, that boundary. Uh, next. Um, so these are some views of the adjacent buildings. Uh, of course, the Field Museum, uh, the, the um, uh, Soldier Field, um, the uh, uh, Shed Aquarium, and then finally the Adler Planetarium. And the view from the steps of the West Entry, the Temple Front, that overlook um, the pavilion that was built as part of uh, one of the Sh Chicago biennials. Um, and the, uh, the skyline of Chicago in the distance, which is always a visual presence in the, uh, in the, uh, on the museum campus and certainly around the Shed Aquarium. Uh, next, um, we'd like to uh, look more closely at the enhanced accessible entrance, which is circled uh, in the plan uh, on the, in the southwest corner of the uh, shed property. So if we go on. Um, this is a, a view or photographs of how you approach the shed. The image in the upper right is uh, the view from the uh, auto drop off where you really can't see either the accessible entrance or the temple front. And Brad will be talking later about his changes to the landscape. And one of the things that I think is really important is that our design is not just limited to um, the um, entrance itself, but the intention is to extend the experience to the areas, the landscape areas surrounding the plaza uh, that holds the man with fish sculpture and fountain. Um, so that it's extremely important that our design be permeable so that people, uh, visitors to the shed, can enjoy the experiences that will be developed in the landscape. But also, Man with Fountain is a very important public uh, 
uh, uh, work of art. And we want it always to be available to the general public, not just to shed visitors. And we also want the general public to be able to enjoy the gardens and the enhanced landscape that site design is developing. And of course, in the lower right, uh, lower left, I'm sorry, um, is the man with fish sculpture, sculpture, which was commissioned and installed uh, 20 some years ago. Uh, and then in the lower, lower right, you can see the existing uh, accessible um, entrance. So going on to the next slide, I think it's important to also understand some of the site constraints that we have um, number one in the center of our plaza is the man with fish, with fish sculpture. Uh, number two is the underground tunnel that connects um, the shed with the field museum, which uh, becomes important to planning the structure of the, uh, of the enhanced entrance. Uh, then we have the existing um, historic terraces um, as number three. Uh, which is the West Terrace, and there's a remnant of the original South Terrace um, uh, immediately adjacent to our uh, new entry building. Um, we also have to provide underground detention. It's presently planned for the area north of this area. Um, then we have the existing Wild Reef building, and there is a, um, uh, a fire exit from the Wild Reef building, which is number six on this plan. And then there's a variety of existing utilities, which um, we have to contend with. And unfortunately, given the uh, complexity of the utility plan on the museum campus, where um, there are uh, utilities at the shed, which serve other parts of the campus, it's a very complicated site that um, is very highly constrained. Okay. I just wanted to note that we have reached the 20 minute mark. Oh, okay. I'll try to pick it up. Um, next, um, uh, we, in developing the design, we really looked at three precedent stru structures, all museum buildings, um, James Sterling, Stotts Gallery in Stuttgart, um, the Barnes Foundation by Todd Williams and Billy Tsen, and then the James Simon Gallery by David Chipperfield in Berlin. All three of these projects um, use an outdoor courtyard as a um, uh, entry, as part of the entry experience. All three are located in cold climates um, and all three uh, I think are recognized as important works of architecture that exhibit the kind of design excellence we're all seeking here. Next. Um, so this is a view of the uh, accessible entrance as it exists today. The two terrace walls to the right and left of the entrance were created when this entrance was built in the late 1980s. They're not historic. Um, we plan on salvaging materials from those um, uh, and using them in other parts uh, of, the, uh, of the plan. Uh, the intent is to keep our connection underneath the belt line, which is a, a feature of the stonework in the aquarium, which is just above the words accessible entrance. And in general, our goal here is to, uh, is to uh, develop a design which is compatible with the historic building, but does not mimic it. Next. Um, so we looked at a number of options, um, uh, actually some 30 options when we were developing the design. Um, the the uh, options in the upper left and upper right are single structure options where the uh, ticketing function and the entry function uh, occur in one building. The images in the lower uh, right and lower left are the uh, our options where we looked at two separate buildings. And what really happened here is, um, and there's a statistic, I think it's worth, uh, worth uh, understanding, is that now 85% of the visitors to the shed arrive on campus uh, with a ticket in hand or on their smartphones. And um, what has happened in many different venues around the world and certainly in, in the United States, um, if you 
have a ticket, whether it's to a plane flight or a, a, a sports event or a museum, you want to avoid the ticketing experience and go right into the building. Um, and um, in many cases, uh, the ticketing operation is to the side or in a separate building or somehow separated from the entry because um, there's such a volume going through the entry, you don't want the people who are arriving on site who need advice or support or help or buy a ticket to be involved with that, with that group. So if we go on, so this is, this is our plan. Um, you can see that uh, one feature of our canopy is that um, uh, it's, it's really designed so that at eye level, it's very permeable. People can go into the landscape, uh, which the, uh, Brad will describe later in the, in the presentation. Um, the ticketing pavilion is designed to meet the demands of the people approaching uh, who need a ticket. The entry pavilion is really designed to satisfy the needs of, um, of, the, of the population that want, wants to enter this building. It's important to note the statistic in the upper left, which is um, of, of the user groups that approach um, the shed, one in five groups, whether it's a family or it's a group of friends, one in five of those groups uh, have needs for mobility assistance. That creates an instant demand for this um, entry. The other um, statistic is that 80% of the visitors to the shed approach from the South. And many of them um, really um, want to enter the building through the accessible entrance and its present capacity just cannot meet that demand. Next. So this is a perspective um, which you saw earlier in, in the presentation, um, which shows the historic building, um, our ticketing building to the uh, far right, our entry building um, adjacent to the historic building and the canopy, which creates that sense of place and that sense of arrival um, that connects and anchors the two um, enclosed pavilions. Next. Uh, this is a view from, um, from the west as if you're approaching from field. You can see the dominance of the historic building and the west temple front, which will remain the main entry to the building. Um, and you can see our pavilions and the canopy uh, to the right. Next. Next. Joe, we're almost out of time, so maybe we can flip through these in, in two minutes and then Brad can close us. Okay. Uh, so uh, cr uh, cross section through the building. Um, next. Um, the entry uh, with the touchless security and, uh, and turnstiles. Next. Uh, the entry uh, uh, hall. This is a two story space which doesn't exist today. It'll include escalators and stairs going up to Kovler and then Kovler Hall. And the intention here is that um, Kovler was always the start of the shed experience and it was a start of your adventure. So we want um, the people arriving through the west entrance and the people arriving through the accessible entrance to begin their experience in this great historic space. Next. Um, this is the expanded North Terrace. I'll go through this very quickly. Uh, next slide, it's in very poor condition. Uh, this will be rebuilt using existing materials um, from the historic building and some new materials. Next. Um, uh, the key here is the large new habitats in the North Pavilion. Uh, next. And those habitats need uh, significant life support equipment. So the terrace is being extended 10 feet to the south and create a basement will be created to house that equipment. Next. I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, one moment. I see Jeannie's hang up, hand up. I just wanna make sure there's a clarification that's needed or something. Um, yeah, sorry. I, I was just asking about, I'll, I'll put it down. I was wanted to make sure we had time to go over the north part and that's all. So. Okay. 
<laughs> so this, this shows the reconstructed North uh, Terrace with the 10 foot extension um, next. And then um, there's an existing uh, dining, uh, outdoor dining terrace um, that serves bubble net. The idea is to enclose this space. If we go on to the next slide, uh, you can see the expanded uh, seating uh, that's really necessary to serve the school groups that visit the shed throughout the year. Uh, next, this is a view of the expanded North Terrace with Lakeside Pavilion uh, to the left. Next. And the image in the lower right shows the existing condition. Uh, this shows the uh, Lakeside Pavilion completed uh, with the um, with a new uh, terrace on the top uh, on its roof. That terrace is level with the rebuilt um, uh, uh, northern uh, terrace, uh, which we've been talking about. Now I think we go on. Uh, elevations showing the three additions on the right and on the left. Uh, our materials are intended to be compatible with historic building um, and um, in, in line with the requirements of the, uh, of the uh, uh, Department of Interior standards. Next. Brad, okay. Brad. All right. Thanks, Joe, and thank you all for being here. I think I've got about 90 seconds to, to go through my slides. So I'll, I'll try and keep it tight and, and keep it uh, keep it close. Um, so as a landscape architect, that site design group here, our, our goal is really to take those goals of um, enhanced accessibility, enhanced user experience, and, and really, um, you know, improving the exhibits and taking it to the exterior. Um, I will say with this slide, um, the, the campus is about four acres. The shed is really taking advantage of everything that they can here to really make this the best public experience you can. You've got picnic groves, you've got um, pollinator gardens on the east, you've got wetland and dune gardens to the, to the uh, south, um, basically pushing right up to that lot line to do what we can. But I'm gonna dive in a little bit further on, on two different areas, the Southwest entry first. So if you can go to the next slide. Here, um, Joe showed you know, different images, renderings of what this could look like. And really one thing that, that stands out is that existing picture. When you get off um, near the 10 on this slide, you don't know where the entrance is. There's a big you know, fancy, it says accessible entrance when you get around that corner, but there's, there's no arrival. This is a, a sense of wonder. You know, there's no, there, there's no um, welcome to this great place where you're about to see dolphins. You're gonna see all this, this fun stuff. So we really wanted to take advantage of that um, and, and really make it something fun. Um, and with that, we've kind of created zones within this area. Um, the north portion of the entry, this is kind of a play space where exhibits can actually come outdoors. Underneath that is where our stormwater is. Uh, to the west, um, there's existing pollinator gardens that we just want to enhance and really kind of flank this ticketing pavilion with something that's equally beautiful and, and seasonal. Um, and then coming to the, the southeast, um, really an enhanced entrance that pulls you through the landscape and gives you that gathering point, that welcome, that aha, um, I've made it to the Shed Aquarium experience. Um, going to the Northwest corner, I probably only have about 15 seconds left. Um, if you can change slides. The, the goal here, what's existing is, you can see the pictures on the right. It's a lawn that is used really only when there's fireworks and people have to hop over a wall to get up there. Um, and then there's a small little woodland garden there where there's a nice hawthorn, a couple of nice understory plantings. Um, we've heard, you know, we've had many meetings with city agencies. We've heard that we want access to this zone. Uh, we want to be able to, you know, restore the, the views and really enhance this experience. So what, that's exactly what we're doing here. We've created a little overlook where you see the one. Uh, number two is an accessible path. Currently, there's, I think, 28 crab apples that are really at the end of their usable life. A lot of them are dead or limbs are, are, are hacked off. Um, taking that and turning it into something more true to museum campus, something that's going to be beautiful year round and, and serve a bit more purpose as far as um, native habitat, something that you can actually come into and, and be pulled into. Uh, what that might look like, we'll take a look at the last slide here. If you could go to the next slide. Um, is you know, just more plantings, more variety, more diversity. Um, still keeping the lawn, really keeping all of the usable space that's used now, but again, giving there you know, a place where you can actually come out into this and access the building. Um, and, and the improvements that are being made. Um, so with that, if you go to the next slide, um, the last thing we have here is just, you know, questions come up, just PD 664, we wanted to show 
um, that we're in the public use zone, give the boundaries uh, again, and, and just really remind people of the site. So with that, I will turn it over to Joe, who's going to lead the uh, lead the questions on this one. Can I just ask first, do you have an image um, of the uh, uh, some sort of perspectival or three-dimensional image of the drop-off area and new entrance pavilion landscape shot? that's separate than that what Joe did or is it all just what Joe showed in his? So we, we put all those together with um, with all the other renderings. So Joe showed okay. some of those. That's great. Entries. That's I just yep. thank yep. Just wanted to make sure. Thank you. Can I can I also ask um, in the same vein, do you have a photo rendering looking at the main temple front or um, looking at the new Lakeside Pavilion basically from the city? like the, they're a little bit further back than that. So you get, you know, how it, how it uh, works with the backdrop of the historic. That's what I'm interested in seeing. Let me just clarify, are we, um, Bradley, are you finished? Is your team finished with the presentation? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, we, okay. we are done with the presentation there. All right, awesome, thank you. Uh, committee members, please take a moment to review any comments received from the public in the Q&A box. There is one uh, and incorporate them however you see fit. Um, we have about 45 minutes for discussion. So uh, committee members, please raise your hand and we will call on you. We figure this is the best uh, to keep things a little bit more orderly and to actually record your comments when we develop them into recommendations. Josh, I believe Josh, do you mean raise your hand using raise your signal? Raise your oh. Zoom hand. Yeah, Thank you. I don't have a Zoom hand, so how do we find that? Uh, do you not where at the bottom of the screen? Yeah, it next just to says, share screen. It just says participants share screen and Q and A. Yeah, that's what, so that's what we talked about. Okay, let me see if maybe Kamal might be able to help. Maybe you signed in as a guest instead of a panelist. I, I might have, I, yeah, okay. that's possible. Yeah, he should, uh, I believe we know that you are now, should be a panelist. Um, so. Uh, uh, no, your screen might not be in full screen. Maybe you, if you wanna put your Zoom, cause it is there for everyone uh, down below, right next to Q and A, there should be a raise hand. Okay, I'll just raise my hand physically. It's, it's, it's it isn't there, so it's fine. Okay. Uh, I think, Maria, I think you were the first one to have your hand raised. Do you have a question? Just a clarification. Um, do you have a map that shows existing tree canopy versus proposed? Yeah, I can take that one first. So in this presentation, I, I don't think we have it, um, but we have created it and, and uh, for other things. What, currently, what we're, we're going to be reducing landscape by about 6,000 square feet. Um, but really we're, we're trying to keep as much open space as possible like the pavilion here the entries all these kinds of things um we're, we're really trying to enhance what's what's happening there uh, but for tree canopy um and quantity the goal is to to match existing and as i mentioned there's the 28 crab apples i'm not sure if you've been out there recently they've been not in the best state for for about a decade um, the goal is to you know recreate something a little bit more native, natural, you know, true to the heritage of the site um, for that location. So not losing tree canopy. It'd be great to have a map. Thank you. I believe Jeannie, you're next. Okay, thanks. Um, um, just a couple things. First, um, I. I think I really want to commend the team on the um, the porosity of the new ticket pavilion and the way that it keeps the space around the sculpture open to the public and sight lines through it and the landscape around that area I think is going to be really nice. So on the on the ticket pavilion element um, and a, an enhancement that will really help the functionality of, of the aquarium, but also um, yeah, if you can go back to, yeah, there. Um, can I just clarify in one word answer that that roof of the pavilions, the two ovals, or are they circular? They are kind of ovals um, that are not tilted. They're straight, correct? 
that's just a quick clarification. They're not tipped one way or the other, but horizontal. You're muted, Joe. <laughs> uh, Jeannie, to answer your question, no, they're not tipped. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, I think that that is a really nice solution, especially with its axis going toward the central um, rotunda as the other additions have shown. So I really want to focus my comments more on the north part, which is the um, the, the creation of a new, a brand new pavilion on the lakefront, um, which is not following those kind of same rules, that one there. Um, and I know that there is a terrace there at you know, lower level right now, but I am kind of concerned that this is going to look like it's just um, added on without much, it, it doesn't seem to follow the same order as the other two. And it's a very large new piece of architecture on the lakefront. So there's just, so that was just the thing, my main concern. So in drilling down into that, I'd like to um, find out if the footprint is fixed in any way or if that could be somehow more deferential to the historic building. I know it's not touching it, um, but it, if you look at it in plan, it really just, you know, it's, it's glommed on kind of to the edge of that building. So that's one thing. Second, that um, I noticed, you know, this is a super sensitive area in terms of bird migration. You talked about in the very beginning, thank you, biodiversity in the city and um, to the, and thanks for the shed aquarium paying attention to that. But I mean, the bird, um, the danger to birds is, is real and, and very significant in this area. And I noticed that you have bird freight glass, but it's following like a kind of an older standard of a two inch a separation of dots by two inches by four inches. And it's really, um, I would hope that it would follow a higher standard in terms of this glass corner for one, uh, the reflections, the fly through danger and all that, those things. So I'm worried about it in terms of its um, relationship to the existing um, biodiversity that we have in the city. And then to that point later, and maybe this is for Brad, is there any chance that that the rooftop could be more uh, could be planted as well to increase um, plants that are attractive to pollinators, et cetera? Um, and then finally, the last thing that I wanted to ask about. So it's kind of the shape, the the shape of the building, the the scale of it, and the glass, uh, but also the um, the landscape, how it, um, it, the pads don't seem to connect around that element because it's really pushing out so far that the, I, I believe the slope would probably be too steep. So, it, and then it's cut off by the stair coming down, but maybe it's possible to have the pads more connected for the public access uh, on that part of the whole north around to the to the east part of this landscape, because right now it's kind of like in these three separate zones. So maybe the public can come up there, but then they can't really go around this building because it's going out so far to the edge. And then um, I don't know if they could traverse over that stair that you see in the lower left-hand corner or not to connect up with other with another path around the, um, the building to make it really super publicly accessible. Can, uh, Jean, let me respond and I'll try to be very short. And then I'd also like to have Brad come in and, com uh, and comment. Um, one thing I have to point out is the stair you see on the left side is existing. That's existing. Okay. First thing on the, on the, uh, uh, on the, uh, uh, uh sh shape of the North Terrace. Shed's request to us, and this is a, uh, a, a, a you know, I think it's a, you made a very, very good point, and I think we'll take a look at the plan 
Uh, the Shed had simply asked us to enclose the existing uh, terrace uh, and we responded in that way. And I think our focal point uh, in the design has been to the accessible entrance. I think we'll uh, reconsider the shape based on your comments. I think that's a very good comment. On the bird safe glad, uh, I'm sorry, on the, on the bird safe strategies, um, we haven't selected the, the type of system we're, we're using, um, but we have set up a meeting with Annette Prince from the Chicago Bird Collision Monitors to specifically help us in the selection of the technology. And we do wanna use the most advanced technology that we can, we can find at this point. So that study is in progress. And then Brad, do you wanna perhaps comment about the uh, accessible pathway that goes from the uh, pavilion wraps around the north side uh, and eventually reaches the plaza in front of the West Temple front. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a couple of questions also in there. Jeannie, I think you mentioned the, the roof deck of the, of the pavilion. Um, I, I, I think that's certainly worth exploring. Uh, the, they're currently utilizing the, the plaza that's there. And you know, there's signage, all these different things to show like different pollinator spaces and all that. So that absolutely is a consideration to be made as, as we continue on this one. Um, for the pathways, the, the plans don't show it, and, and my, my rushed presentation uh, didn't let me get into the sections and everything a bit more, but the we're trying to keep this path pretty tight up against the building. The drop-off there is, is pretty intense, um, so much so that for every foot that we would shift out further, we would start to cre you know, create a need for the wall, and we're trying to avoid any walls you know, as much as possible on that slope. We just don't want to have you know, this landscape and then, you know, a series of 30 inch terraces all the way up that, that side. So we're, we're trying to keep it tight and, and also meet the one to 20 slopes. So we're not putting a bunch of handrails out there and, and really kind of creating, you know, more universally designed thing that seems more intentional and not just here's an accessible route that gets you over to the buildings. Um, if we were to come out further and wrap around the pavilion, like you had mentioned, that slope drops off really quite drastically. Actually, there's an existing kind of defunct um no not defunct but it, it's a it's a water feature that like you can see it it's like a waterfall how the grades drop off there so we're trying to be elegant and, and really also respond to kind of what maria was talking about not stealing um landscape green space you know opportunity for trees and, and really keep paving to a minimum good question great thanks um i believe eleanor you are next followed by juan Thank you. Um, okay, so just to follow up on my earlier question, I would suggest in the next round that you guys do have a photo rendering of that pavilion, um, basically from the harbor, looking back to see how it um, how it looks with the historic building and the Oceanarium addition, as well as I'd like to see a photo rendering of the new elements um, aimed at the front entrance to see how they do or do not impact that that view. Um, I also want to congratulate you on the drop off on the south side. I think this is a great improvement. Um, I'm excited when this is done to actually use it and try it out. And I think that the play garden that you show just north of the entry is a great idea too um, for all the families and kids that will be gathering there. The one question I did have, and um, I'm going to hit the historic preservation um, of the main hall. I wondered if you have a rendering or a floor plan that shows where the escalator and the elevator come up. I know that we don't have a lot of room for questions, but I guess that is um, an area of sensitivity that I'm interested in how that interfaces with the historic materials in that main hall, how that gathering happens. I know there's elevators already that go up there, but I didn't see anything that showed where the public will now go from this new entrance up into that main hall. You reference if I didn't see it. So I think that is something that should be looked at. Uh, yeah, uh, we have studied that extensively. The idea is of course that the temple front entry, the west entry is symmetrical and has a whole series of doors that enter into Kofler Hall. 
Mm -hmm. Inside Kovler Hall, if you look at the south elevation, there are uh, three openings uh, in the south elevation. And where we're entering from the south is through that center opening. So um, whether you're coming in through the temple front or whether you're coming up through the escalators, you will arrive basically on one of the center lines of Kovler Hall. And so, uh, I'm sorry, so these images do not show where that escalator's coming up. No, correct. They, they, okay. They don't, but we we did we have you can imagine we have hundreds of drawings. Okay. Sure, sure. And we have we have renderings of Kovler uh, that show where the uh, where the escalators come up um, and uh, you know of the hundreds of drawings and photographs we have of the project, we had to pick the ones to include. And by the way, we also have a rendering that's centered on the temple front. And one of the problems is that you can't really see the enhanced entrance from that center line. But that's not the problem. That's the exact reason why I wanted to see it. Okay. Well, uh, right. We, yeah. <laughs> well, Joe, can I jump in real quick? Sure. To, um, yeah. Eric Rogero with McGuire Glesky, the historic preservation consultant. Um, it's hard to see in the left photo but the smaller opening that is just almost off of the, out of view, I believe that's where the elevator will come up. Um, I think that's where it is now, right? Yeah, I, yeah. I'll let someone else answer that. I can't remember, but historic, okay. I think historically, actually this space was a um, telephone booth that is no longer intact. Mm, okay. Um, and so we're utilizing a, non-character defining space in Kovler Hall to bring in this new elevator. And then um, the kind of maintaining the hierarchy of the entrance openings, as you can see in the, in kind of those rear openings on either side where you have a very classical entablature, marble entablature surrounding the opening. We're not going to duplicate that at this new opening. We're going to keep it very simple and rectilinear how it is now. Um, obviously, the opening will have to be taller to accommodate the, ele the elevator, but we're going to keep the hierarchy of the ornamentation um, the same, if that hopefully answers your question a little bit better, Eleanor. I, I was more concerned about the escalator and where that's oh, sorry, up. escalator. I mean, I, I, I'm I have sorry. I have I in mind an elevator. The, the, the City Hall out escalator that comes up right through the middle yes. of the lobby. Yeah, I'm and sorry. that's what I'm I was. Elevator. It that, is the that's escalator. what I'm curious about. Yeah, so it's the um, escalator. Maybe DPD staff and the historic preservation staff can look at that. And I see that uh, I have other more. folks that are raising their hands. So I'll I'll accede to them. Eleanor, if I could just respond, because this is Bridget O'Keefe, the escalator yeah. and the elevator come in behind the existing walls. So those existing walls, there will not be them coming directly into Kovler Hall. Great. Um, so That's I just want to make Thank sure you. we address that question. Thank you. I, I'm relieved. Thanks. Uh, I believe, Juan, do you want to ask your question, followed by Amanda Williams? Sounds good. Thanks, Josh. First, Joe, uh, congrats on a thoughtful presentation. It was really enjoyable to listen to you just talk about that. It's it's an incre incredibly complex project. And just uh, following up on, on the previous comments, um, someone who takes their two and six-year-old, I am grateful that you guys are doing this. Um, I'm, I'm really curious, Joe, you know, it, it was wonderful to see the thought process of the options and um, because I, I was just looking at some historical just photos, aerial photos, and it was interesting that um, you, know, you didn't have as many curvilinear lines in the past, certainly over time, that's the way the, the paths have evolved. But as the, the new ticket entry um, evolved in your design process, it, it took on a circular language and not one that references, let's say, the hexagonal length or the octagon language of the shed, kind of a, and I'm silver simplifying the description of the geometry, but if you could just share like how that led you to the circular form, especially when I look at the old photos, it, it really, 
the paths there were linear. They weren't circular. And I'm just curious, like where, where the mind went more than anything else, Jim. Um, one of the 30 options we looked on at, a few of the 30 options we looked at, tried to use an octagon as a planning feature, right? And one of the difficulties an octagon has is that it's, it's hard to approach. It's a, it's a difficult object to, to, to kind of figure out how to render in the exterior of the building. And um, we also felt that if we use the octagonal language, it just felt like we were struggling to match the, the kind of uh, grandeur of the rotunda. And so what we decided to do was we decided to orient it on the, on the secondary axis. Um, and we also felt that the um, curved shapes of both the Oceanarium and the Wild Reef um, really felt, in our minds anyway, felt really good um, uh, in, the, in the fact that they weren't angular. Um, in fact, one of the criticisms we got from one of the preservations groups was, shouldn't, shouldn't your two pavilions be more angular? And, you know, our feeling was, this is a wonderful way to uh, announce that these are new additions and not part of the historic building but feel compatible with the, with the historic building. That was, that was how we arrived at, at this decision. Thank you, Joe. Next one, uh, Amanda Williams followed by Jackie Koo. Hi, sorry, I can't turn my video screen on now. Um, thank you for the presentation. And I, I too wanna echo having children bringing them here I cheat and use the vehicle drop off now, even after not needing it anymore. Um, so I really like the attention paid to that. And it, it sounds from the comments you made and the fact that you pointed out your signage and wayfinding consultant that you're already thinking along these lines, but I would say also just continued emphasis on while the, the play area and all that uh, site design have done is wonderful on a day like today where it's freezing and you just really want to get inside, just continued emphasis to, um, encourage and orient people to use um, the non-accessible entrance if in fact you want to try to um, kind of extend people away from that. I know that, that that becomes a much more convenient entrance for folks that have parked um, on Solidarity Drive. Um, so I think that the, the arrangement is beautiful, but also just continued emphasis to kind of redirect people around to either the, the kind of grand stair or if there's a, a kind of... Um, flow of pedestrian traffic that you want to happen that the, the signage and wayfinding can help um, with the lines. I, I think that the, the curve does give a, a kind of nice compliment to the way that the pathways are already oriented. I don't know if, if uh, landscaping is gonna change any of those Southeast um, kind of pathways as they've been drawn on the site plan. Um, and then a, a, sort of an extension of that same idea on the North Terrace I understand what you're saying about the kind of steep drop that will happen um, if you if you try to kind of uh, change the typography of the of that green space. But it also might be an opportunity for some additional outdoor classrooms or signage and wayfinding. Again, just enhancing the use of a space that essentially becomes something to look at because maybe it's difficult to traverse. Is there a way, even if you don't have the wall, to use it as an educational opportunity, especially if that if that terrace is gonna be used for classroom space or some kind of group educational sorts of spaces. Um, so it sounds to me like you're already doing it, but I just wanted to offer that, that feedback to really encourage that, um, that last element of signage and wayfinding is, is probably the most important, especially more so on days like this, where you're cold or you're disoriented or you're not really interested in lingering outside. I think the summers we all know are beautiful opportunities to come it's, you know, enjoy the outdoor space as much as the interior of the museum, but on, on those less um, a minimal day, amenable days, is there a way to make sure that you're encouraging the kind of flow that you want, despite um, the, the tendency to want to 
repeat old habits of how we've been accessing the building for those of us that use it frequently. I think I can quickly answer, at least from the guest perspective, that thank you, Amanda, for that comment. And we've thought a lot about it. And one of the first things that we wanted to make sure happened at that new accessible entrance is, especially on days like this, that it is ready for anyone who wants to use it, that we don't have to tell people, no, you can't go in here, that our west entrance remains remains open, remains a primary feature of our building and is ready for everyone who wants to use it, but that we move away from needing to tell people that our accessible entrance isn't large enough to accommodate those who would like to use it. Um, currently, that's a frustration for many guests and we want to really be guest first and allow those that would like to use that entrance to move on through. We have far more of capacity than we need at that space. And we will continue to maintain that to make sure that there's always an easy flow, especially if people already have tickets. And so um, we certainly are prioritizing wayfinding and will continue to do so. Um, but I just thought I'd make that comment. And also thank you for the thought on the outdoor spaces. We certainly are thinking about how we can use nature as a classroom more and more as we enhance these gardens. And Joe and Brad may have additional thoughts, but I just wanted to at least share that guest um, focused perspective. Yeah, I'll just let Brad respond on the use of the north uh, north area for extended um, programming. Brad? Yeah, no, these are all great comments. And, and Megan, I'm not going to say anything much more eloquently than you, but really good points. Uh, getting that straight path into the southwest entry um, is crucial. You know, it's going to be the direct path. It's going to be a much better experience all along. And I imagine if you can have some exhibits out there, so you're not going so many feet before you start seeing some animals as well. So I hear you loud and clear there on the north. That's exactly what we're going for. Um, you know, right now the 28, and I'll say it's probably more like 23 um, actual, you know, working crab apples that nobody accesses isn't necessarily doing much for both the native ecosystem um, or the users of the park and just the general public. So our goal there is to really create another opportunity because right now it's, I, I hate to use the expression, but the campus is packed to the gills with anything. If there's a space where you can put a beehive or vegetable gardens, you know, the Shedd Aquarium is doing that. Um, but really this, this North Terrace, it's really unused space underneath this area. So we want to create kind of a woodland. Um, I think I mentioned, you know, heritage plants, things that would be here um, historically and, and really make it another opportunity for people to experience and, and, um, and learn something as well. So really good comments. Uh, Jackie, followed by Catherine Baker. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm just, I just want to echo what other people have said in terms of the porosity of that entrance pavilion. I think that that's really fantastic. And, um, you know, my particular interest is increasing the size of where you have jazz in on the shed. I think that's awesome. I think that'll be a wonderful, really much more usable space that a lot of people will enjoy. Um, I do have some questions just about detailing. Um, aside from the question that Jeannie asked about the flatness of the two enclosed spaces, um, like if you look in the section, are those also the same height or are they different heights? Just out of curiosity. The, uh, the, uh, uh, the ticketing pavilion is lower. It's 14 feet six. The entry pavilion is higher at 17 feet. Okay. I'm just wondering if, um, you know, that's enough difference to, you know, consider whether that's, you know, the right answer. I don't know if it's the right answer for like a minimalist approach that you're taking. Um, uh, it, the, the problem with the entry pavilion is that it's, it's, it's extremely complex in cross section because we're trying to get down under that belt line in the historic facade. Yeah. But are, are you suggesting that the, that the entry building should be lower? I'm not quite sure. I'm not sure what I'm suggesting. I'm just wondering about the three heights because the trellis itself is, is a bit lower or mm -hmm. is it coplanar with the, with one of the pavilions? No, the, 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 the trellis or the canopy is, is the lowest element. And okay. we, and again, I think this cross section really shows 
how porous it is at grades so that people can enjoy the landscape that, um, that uh, a brand is designed and, uh, and move kind of efforts, effortlessly in and out of this uh, exterior courtyard. And then the next highest element is the, is the, uh, uh, is the ticketing building. Uh, the highest element is the entry building. Okay, I'm sure, I mean, I'm sure you'll make the right choice. Um, and then I'm just wondering about the North Terrace. Is there a new railing then on the North Terrace? The, the, the North Terrace- When you expand it, is it, I mean, the, um, yeah. Yeah, the, 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 the uh, Jackie, the, just to, to be clear, um, for Lakeside Pavilion and the enhanced accessible entrance, uh, we're using materials compatible with the historic building. In the North Terrace, we're actually um, basically rebuilding the terrace out of um, salvage materials with some new materials. We, we, don't, we don't feel we have enough salvage material, but it's actually a rebuild rather than a compatible design. Okay, I got gotcha. you. And then I guess the last thing is just really the intersection with that enclosure in the lakeside pavilion to the existing building. That's, you know, just kind of how it's really just right up against there. And is there another, you know, level of investigation to look into on that front as well? <clears throat> Could be. I mean, are you, you're suggesting it's it, it would be better to have that building appear to be more freestanding. Yeah, um, I'm just, I don't know if it's more freestanding or if it's just a diff. You know, I'm sure you'll detail it in some way that makes it the right answer. Okay. Yes. That's it for me. Okay. Uh, Catherine Baker, followed by Reed, then Philip. Hi. Um, again, I, I I echo I think every everything that ever that everyone has said um, ahead of me. The the entrance is incredibly sensitive and really well done. With that said, I wonder if if you can use our group here to maybe help with the um, the bus drop off. Um, it it seems like if you arrive by bus, you're immediately confronted with a curb cut. And it looks like there are some nice benches along the way to the entry, but I'm just thinking you have this accessible entry, but if you were arriving by bus, it's still a little bit, I think slide 13 might show it the best. Um, how do you get from the bus around? You know, there's the vehicle drop off, you have to navigate through that and then you get to the entry. And again, this is might be out, this is probably outside your scope, but maybe again, this, this venue that we have might help you with some conversations with um, CTA or, you know, it, or can the, can the bus drop off be located closer to the vehicle drop off? So you're not first confronting that curb cut into the um, employee parking lot. Yeah. I mean, the, the difficulty is that um, there is, you know, this is, this is the problem with the shed. It's basically out on a peninsula and that, you know, it, it needs a loading dock because you can imagine the loading functions and there is that curb cut. And, and if there was anything we could do to make the curb cut disappear, it would be, it would be great. One of the things we studied early on in the project, and I think this, you might find this interesting, is we suggested that the small parking area south, um, southeast of the field and south of the shed be turned into uh, an inter intermodal uh, transportation center that would have the handicapped parking that you really require. It would have uh, a taxi and rideshare drop off lane, and it would have a bus lane. And it would, it would allow the buses to drop their passengers in a way that they didn't have to cross a driveway in order to get to either the field museum or the shed. And of course we were told that that parking lot is very important to the bears. So I'd love to chime in as well to say, we're really thrilled that the mayor has assembled a museum campus committee. And I think 
Catherine, you're right that there's certain things we can do to help with that. And there's other things that we might need a broader body. And I think that'll be an excellent opportunity to look at challenges like that and think about how we might make this campus far more usable for everyone who comes. I think that bus drop off is something that we'll definitely take down in our notes of the things we hope will be addressed in that planning. I'm thrilled that that's happening in the same time frame as we're working on this project because I think there's so many opportunities for us to work together to to have additional lift on campus. So thank you for bringing that forward. Catherine, I believe Reed is next followed by Phil. Um, could I ask to slip forward on the slides to the uh, eye level view of the entry pavilion? That one will work. That'll work too. Um, uh, I just have a few questions. I'm trying not to repeat things that other people have said. Um, uh, let me start with, uh, I'm a little concerned that this plaza will be a fantastic place in the summer and a windswept, barren, frozen, slippery thing in the winter um, that won't have a lot of people in it. And I'm just wondering if there are any things that can be done to either bring the landscape in in a protective fashion or do something to help mitigate the wind, um, the wind that moves through there at a pretty high clip all year long, um, but particularly in the winter. Um, and I don't know whether that would mean possibly Joe extending wing-like projections. I'm not sure what it is. It just looks like it's designed for summer and it looks like it would be a really nice place in the summer, really, really nice. Um, but it looks like it would not be that nice uh, to be there in the winter. And a couple of other people have mentioned that um, so uh, I, I want to emphasize, sorry, I want to reinforce a concern about that. Second, a question, is why are the under or, or are the undersides of this, of these roof, of these pavilion roofs and the, and the arcade roofs implying a wooden finish? It, yes, it is a wood finish. And could you explain where wood comes from in a landscape of, of lots and lots of stone and um, steel? Um, we looked at a number of different options, Reed. Uh, we looked at uh, a plaster solution uh, because the, you know, Kovaler is a wonderful hall and it's very simple materials. It's plaster castings and a very small amount of stone. So we looked at plaster, we looked at metal, uh, we looked at wood, and I think it was the humanity of wood, of the wood material, its warmth, its kind of biophilic character that, uh, 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 that the, the, our, our team and the shed was drawn to, especially when the landscape that Brad is designing it really is a biophilic experience, okay? And we invite you know, uh, uh, your comment on that, uh, if you think uh, we're making the wrong decision. Uh, but I, we, I don't I don't know that it's the wrong decision. It just strikes me as an uh, as a kind of jangling jangling decision. It it's it's out of architecturally lang the architectural language is very different than everything else. Um, and just strikes me as a as a bit I don't know what uh, 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 just a little out of character with everything else um, in the in the building um, or that part of the building, not inside, but outside of the building. Um, but um, I'll leave that to your judgments because the the I think that I agree that the basic move here uh, of creating this plaza and doing it at the angle is really smart um, and thoughtful and um, I would I think it's going to be so popular that the museum's going to find almost everybody entering this way. So when I heard the uh, Megan um, speaking in favor of it, I uh, just encourage her to be careful what you wish for and to make sure that um, we don't undershadow, undershadow the, the main entrance. The final thing I want to say and then I'll be done is uh, the landscape is very pretty. 
um, and um, but seems a little small scale in 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 its uh, a little fine grained um, relative to the mass of the building um, and the kind of general character of the place. Um, it might it might benefit from some larger gestures um uh in in how it's laid out rather than like 10 little or eight six little things maybe only four and they're uh, they're at a, a a somewhat larger uh or sort of somewhat more a monumental scale to go um with the building that's all around them i i know you're trying to transition down and i get that and i totally agree with that but maybe just not quite as much um of it Reed, I would just, I, I don't want to lose the question about um, the plaza in the winter. And I will say that we, we use it now and we have an excellent snow removal process. We're really confident in that ability to make sure that that plaza is usable, safe. And I agree with you. We'll have to make sure that people know they can continue to use that west facade and we'll make sure that that stays centered. I don't know if there's anything that Brad would like to add on landscape, et cetera, um, but yeah. I didn't want to lose that comment. Yeah. Really good point, Megan. And I will say also that right now we're, the plaza is relatively similar in size to what we're proposing here. We're getting a little bit bigger, but more or less it, it's going to be the same. So with the addition of the structure, a windbreak somewhat in the ticket pavilion um you know the, it, it should be enhanced from what it is now either way um as far as the landscape you know adding a little bit more to it you know a couple of larger gestures um this is showing you know green space we're, we're getting into kind of the nuance and, and the detail of what the species are and the selection all that so we're we're not opposed at all to to having a couple of key moments and things that really um you know, play with what we have here, which is, you know, an iconic building, an iconic space, something that we all go to and will go to regularly. You know, we, we want the landscape to be, you know, we don't want to detract from the building, but we, we want to add to it, really just add to, to everything out there. So we hear you loud and clear on that one. Great. I, just to conclude, it, it's not to add more. It's to, I'm suggesting maybe a little less um, and, and a kind of a stepping down in scale. But um, I think I've made my point, so I, I don't I don't need to go any further. Thank you very much, and congratulations. This is a lot of good work. Thanks, Reed. And I think, Philip, you will be our last uh, commenter today. And if any other COD members have any comments, please feel free to email me, as well as anyone that's spoken. If you'd like to email me your comments just to make sure I've accurately <clears throat> covered them, that would be great. Thanks. All right. Thank, thank you, Josh. Uh, and I'll make this very brief. Uh, I don't want to echo what everyone else has been saying, but I would like to commend the design team, I think for especially the Southwest corner and the entry pavilion and plaza, I think it's very interesting. I, I wanted to direct my comments to the North edge. Uh, also, I, I just wanted to express that just from my perception of this presentation, the you have these pieces on the north side, you have the existing north terrace, you have now a new pavilion being proposed and a roof terrace on top of the new pavilion. You have a landscape setback really from the lakefront trail uh, and you have the lakefront trail. And I know that some of this goes outside of your property boundaries, but everything to me feels uh, for such a remarkable place in Chicago on the south edge of Monroe Harbor and Grant Park and the beginning of the museum campus, it feels like all these pieces are fragmented. Could these pieces come together into a more holistic idea for the north side that is maybe more public, uh, more accessible, uh, more remarkable? It, it just has never been great. Uh, and I'm not sure this one new pavilion and restoring the North Terrace makes it great. And it really should be for the location that it's in. So that's my, my only comment is to the Shedd Aquarium, to the city DPD, to the park district and the design team 
I would encourage you all to work together to make the north side of the shed much more remarkable. If we have time, uh, Josh, I'll be brief. Sure. Um, I just want to make sure uh, to the applicant team, do you want to respond to Philip's comments? Uh, yes. <laughs> I think we, we really need to take a, one more look at this uh, and, uh, and uh, ask ourselves if, uh, if there can be a better integration of the pieces. Great, hey, Maria? Right, I just wanted to second uh, Phil here um, and regarding the opportunity that transforming the North um, part of uh, the project brings. Um, to an institution that is all about marine life, right? What an extraordinary opportunity to actually celebrate uh, the lake and the aquatic species of the lake and the fact that it's really creating how this edge could really elevate that historic stair and, 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 trans and create a spaces that transitions, right? So I think the North, um, area uh, opens up a really interesting design question where we can think of these new spaces as thresholds rather than as edges that are solid and feel private, as Phil was saying. And um, it opens up the palette on really thinking about what facing the lake for an institution that celebrates marine life uh, cool mean, right? Like, I think it could be an extraordinary place where the lake can be part of that proposition, uh, where the boundaries between uh, architecture and, uh, and, and landscape architecture can be transformative and can blend in a more meaningful way. Uh, and perhaps that's the path towards the grandeur that Phil was talking about, where the public and the private meet. Um, my spaces kind of mix. And I will say that once that is discovered, when that exploration is conducted, it might influence uh, the rest of the campus, right? I mean, the paradigm is, uh, you know, um, uh, from the landscape sort of the, the approach to the entry um, is this constant tension between vehicular access and pedestrian access, right? And I think. Um, the magic carpet at the Lincoln Center in New York is a great example to look at because it provides a solution that works for both. Um, so while I, um, while I, I imagine that the proposition you have uh, has gone through a lot of iterations, I can't help but wonder what will happen if the entrance pavilion uh, becomes a more integral part of the historic structure and it creates a more generous fluid opening of the landscape towards the building um, where we don't actually ever feel the distinction between car access and pedestrian access and it can all be safely controlled. Uh, and there are great examples of that. But I think the key is uh, the North parcel, right? That will set the design ambition for a marine institution at a, in a peninsula. Um, uh, and from the celebration of that life and that identity of being by the lake, celebrating those aquatic forms of life, um, I think from there you will find path to um, take your proposition and your ambitions and your beautiful project to the next level. Thank you. I'll just say a few words to say I appreciate those comments. I think we've long thought of shed as a gateway to nature and thought about how both in internally within our exhibits and ex in our exterior in our gardens and all of our entry points, how we might make that as you know positive as possible. I look forward to both taking all your comments in and thinking about how that influences our plans as well as then participating in the museum campus conversations. Um, our organization will be active in that and think about how we exist as part of the campus and also enhance the, you know, the plans to make the best of our position on the lakefront. And so thank you all very much. We'll certainly take this 
um, all back and, and take it into advisement. All right. And again, I think if anyone else had any comments, please feel free to email them to me. And for those who have commented, if you can shoot me an email with those, again, to make sure that I accurately have them recorded. We will now move on to the second item on the agenda. To the applicant team, please clearly state your name and your relation to the project prior to speaking. You have about 20 minutes to present your proposal. Committee members, please hold your comments and questions until after each presentation. Emily, if you want to go ahead and pull up your presentation, go over the summary. Located at 170 North Green Street in the 27th Ward, the applicant is proposing hotel, residential, and office programs that complement the Fulton Market neighborhood. The mix of uses allows the project to be active throughout the day and evening. The residential building mass is offset from adjacent towers, preserving access to daylight for both projects. The hotel building mass is sited to the south, creating a backdrop for the historic district while aligning with the south facade of neighboring buildings. The office building mass references to the scale of surrounding structures. The ground floor of the project extends the open space of the neighboring development, providing an additional 13,000 square feet of open air plaza that cuts the site from east to west. This gesture orients pedestrian activity from the Morgan stop through to Halstead Street. Please proceed with the presentation and again, state your name prior to speaking. Thank you. Thank you. Good, good afternoon. I'll just do a, a brief introduction before we dive into the presentation. Um, my name is Allison Mills and I'm a vice president at CRG. For those of you who aren't familiar with us, we are the real estate development and investment arm of Clayco, the general contractor headquartered here in Chicago. And we've recently been fortunate to collaborate and venture with our partners at Shapac to build on their success across the street from us at 167 Green and their familiarity with the neighborhood. And together we are the developer of the proposed project at 170 North Green. Um, and Jeff Shapac is also on the phone with me and we'll be here to answer any questions that you may have about the development. Um, some of you may have seen various iterations of the project proposed for this site in the past, but CRG Clayco has very recently started the demolition of the existing building on site, which many of you may have seen. So we're overall very excited about the forward momentum of this project and excited to be here um, and present the project to you today. So with that, I'd like to introduce you to our architecture team, the Lamar Johnson Collaborative. They'll be leading the presentation and doing most of the talking. Um, and they are in-house to us here at CRG and Clayco. So from LJC, we've got Tyler, Johnny, and Sarah on the line. Um, and I will turn it over to them to walk you through the design. Thanks, Allison. Uh, this is Tyler Meyer, uh, Managing Director and Design Leader at LJC. And as you just heard, you know, this project is really in the heart of what's a really vibrant Fulton Market area. Uh, it's going to bring an innovative program mix to Fulton Market that we haven't seen there. Uh, positively engage with its urban neighbors and create an iconic structure that continues to elevate design excellence in the district and really build on all the energy that's there. Uh, you know, it includes 350,000 square feet of office, 275 residential units, uh, 150 key hotel with shared amenities and retail that activate the ground, mid and upper levels of the building. You can go to the next slide. You know, as we think about uh, the planning and design guidelines, uh, there are several districts that either affect or uh, directly or nearby within the site. Um, and this design has been informed by both of those and comments from our neighbors. Uh, we paid particular attention to uh, the West Loop design guidelines and a few of those that stood out for us were the promotion of mixed use, uh, careful site planning, focus on the pedestrian environment and landscape, height transitions with neighbors, as well as quality materials. You can go to the next. And the context, uh, I think everyone's familiar with the neighborhood. Uh, we are just outside the historic district, which moves uh, in and out around uh, the block. But, you know, this is a site where we want to fit both in with some of those historic buildings, as well as uh, the newer urban fabric that's being created there while uh, ensuring that we improve walkability and connectivity, including to the CTA station. Um, you know, when it comes to a little bit more detail on the site, it is a very dynamic area that's quickly changing with new buildings, uh, different types of uses, amazing hotels and restaurants that you've probably all visited, offices and residential. 
you know, how do we bring that kind of energy that's happening across the district all together on this site? And, you know, we also have to think about the diverse massing and architecture that's there, those historic buildings, recently completed warehouse inspired aesthetic, as well as the newer, more progressive projects that are really evolving the character of the area. And we may, we really aim to build on that. You can go to the next slide. These are some fairly recent drone photos. Uh, if we could go back to that one, uh, it was a little bit warmer when those were taken, but you can, and you know that some of the buildings that are there have been completed now, but you start to see that rich texture we just talked about. You know, when it comes to urban design, uh, we wanted to start with the ground plane. You know, this is really critical to achieve some of those goals we mentioned earlier. So we here are just mapping out whether it's lobbies, retail, loading uh, of the adjacent streets. And you see it's a fairly large parcel at uh, just over 62,000 gross square feet. Um, and we really wanted to think about how this relates to the context, especially uh, 167 and the success of the muse across the street, across green. You go to the next slide. So we really wanted to continue uh, that pedestrian realm mid-block connector uh, through our site. And so what you see here uh, with that line is how the Muse continues and creates a, a little bit wider public space that mm -hmm. continues to uh, enhance that. And it's flanked on either side by retail on the north, retail and lobby on the south. Um, so we're really excited about how we can maintain retail on green and connectivity through the site. Next slide, please. This is just a little more detail as the, it started to evolve with the larger retail space on the north, the hotel, bar, restaurant, uh, lobby on the south, uh, office lobby at the center, similar to the Muse, residential um, lobby at the corner of Peoria and Lake, and of course we have back of house access to parking. Next slide, please. This series of diagrams really talks about how the mass evolves and it relates to the program and to its neighbors. Just above that uh, retail and amenity base, uh, we have the office. And here you see it's a, it's a large floor plate shaped in a U that wraps around a, a light well at the heart opening up to green. Um, there's a connector there and a bridge that links uh, four defined edges. So we break down the scale through some articulations of the facade and think about them as individual neighborhoods that can work together. And then above that, we have uh, the residential and the hotel, um, as well as a, a terrace of amenities that's uh, provided access to all of the programs of the building. And you see on the right how those start to connect to the volumes below and really define those two corners of the site. So here we see the building in context, both existing and new, uh, like 900 Randolph, which is just under construction on the left side of the image. And our goal was to really have uh, an urban building that relates on all sides to those buildings. So as a holistic element, it sometimes steps back, it addresses the street, we'll, it rises high uh, at the two corners. We'll talk more about some of those details later, but we really wanted to ensure that those four masses were distinct and breaks down the scale of what's a pretty large building here. Um, it of course maintains that urban edge behind the historic district and thinks about height transitions as an advantage here. Uh, the elevation reinforces that here. We're just looking at the heights of uh, the building moving from 167 on the right at about 265. We're uh, rising to about 430 and then the 900 building uh, nearing 500. But you can see how uh, it appears to be in some ways multiple buildings that steps as it moves from east to west here in the building elevation. And then now we're looking at the west elevation where you have that connection into that extension of the Muse and the main public space. And here you see that's a much more voluminous space, which we'll talk about more. The hotel on the left and the residential building on the right sitting above the office. And just one more contextual view that shows 167 uh, green on the left the future 900 uh, Randolph uh, behind uh, the residential building. And you start to see here the, the U-shaped office defining the edges of the block with the residential and hotel volume sitting atop uh, the bridge there at green. You know, when we think about what design excellence means here, uh, it really means that this is a great neighbor and a great part of the neighborhood, yet it does some special things. And, you know, when we think about how to create an inclusive design process. That's why we're here to, to get feedback and continue to improve this. 
innovation is the fact here that we have hotel, office, and residential all coming together. And what's a pretty new typology here in Fulton Market? All these things exist, but in this is a, a new way of really combining them on one site. We want to make sure we're creating a sense of place with uh, a true uh, public realm at the ground level that's big enough to hold gatherings as well as serve the building itself. Uh, we're thinking about how to orient the buildings when it comes to uh, sunlight and using wellness and performance uh, metrics to uh, focus our uh, design as we move forward. And then, you know, once again, thoughtfully listening to the community. <laughs> And we'll show here how we're um, addressing uh, some of the West Loop design guidelines. And when it comes to height transitions, uh, you can see we're moving from uh, really three different main levels here. And we feel like that uh, starts to enhance that relationship with some of the other buildings. That stepped approach is something that's suggested. Uh, we're also thinking about um, how you, when there are multiple towers within a single block that you have a diversity of heights and that we wanna space those uh, as well as defining the street at the ground level. We did look at some precedents and, you know, how do you continue to evolve the, the neighborhood language? And these precedents are more about kind of the texture scale of elements that we expect to see on the building and maybe even some of the warmth of colors and materials. And here we're on the left, we're looking at a view just above uh, Lake. You can see the L running by at the amenity level with the office component there in the front, residential on the right and office on the left. Uh, the relationship to Hoxton and 167 really create an urban composition in that upper level, but at the ground floor, uh, creating a great scaled public realm. Next slide, please. Um, and we are here looking at how we can strengthen the street wall. Could you go back one, please? Uh, with the design guidelines at the lower levels, space the towers further apart as suggested and use smaller scale articulations to bend the building away from the street. Next slide, please. And here we're looking at a view uh, from Peoria. This is the, the residential above uh, the office component here. And you'll see uh, a diagram of the plan there of uh, the floor plate for the residential, really defining this corner as we uh, don't have a neighbor except across the street here with the building that comes down to the ground. And you'll notice the facade uh, is a, is a it's a singular approach to the elevation, uh, but it does transition in scale when you're moving from office to amenity to retail and above to the residential. And then now we're looking uh, from Randolph over some of those historic buildings uh, to the hotel component uh, above the office. Again, you see the continuation of the retail along Green Street, amenities at that mid-level that are shared between the office and hotel above, and of course, a great rooftop restaurant and another uh, version of that articulation of the facade that brings some scale to the building. I just want to note that we've reached the 20 minute mark. Thanks. Thank I mean, sorry, the 10 minute mark. Okay, cool. Um, I mean, here we're looking at the office floor plan on the left, uh, another view from Randolph uh, behind Nobu, where you start to see that relationship between buildings that are uh, have been there for some time, as well as more, uh, you know, future buildings like 900 Randolph on the left. So you really have a great mixture of textures and we feel like um, this building, the goal was that it has some of that same thing. So you know that you're looking at the same building when you're looking at for corners, but the perspective really changes and that's part of the dynamism and the energy uh, that it brings. And we're trying to ensure that this is a really healthy and sustainable floor plate for office, a lot of great natural uh, daylight. We'll talk more about that when we get to the plan later. But it really, some of those articulations mean that we have more corner windows, again, and breaking down the scale of the block. And once again, those guidelines here, you start to see, uh, you know, that continuation of the street wall, uh, steps at the base, um, lining the building with active ground floor uses, and really clearly defined entries. Next slide, please. And then we're really looking here at the heart of the project. Uh, we're on Green Street, looking into that extension of the Muse, but now we've really expanded the height of that volume uh, with the U-shaped office component and the bridge linking them above. 
Um, the scale of the exterior skin really changes here. You have some warm uh, materials, uh, deep more details into the retail facades uh, on the right and left, landscape at the ground plane, and really thinking about how the several thousand people a day will come here to go to work, the people who live here, pedestrians who are utilizing this space on the weekends, um, people who are hanging out at night after work is done in the cafes at the ground floor, you know, really bringing together um, a wide range of uses here. We also want to introduce, we'll talk more about the plaza later, uh, landscape, art, uh, dynamic lighting that really makes this a special place to be. Next slide, please. Um, and as this moves through the building, of course, the program changes. So there's a scale shift between that larger entry off green <clears throat> and the connection through to Peoria. What we've done here is take that uh, skin that you see above with some three-dimensional panels, started, those start to grow, and this sort of uh, optimistic bronze or copper color uh, wraps underneath uh, with a shinier surface that, it, again, continues something referenced in 167, but brings a lot of daylight deeper into the space and really marks this as an entrance with retail on both sides off of Peoria. Next, please. And then here we're back to Lake and Peoria. This is our, where our residential building comes down. Of course, the L here starts to give a lot of articulation uh, as part of the streetscape and the building. You see above how those uh, subtle changes along the facade start to break down the scale. So it doesn't feel like one large facade, but two, a transformation in scale between office and residential above. And uh, that color that you see on the three-dimensional panels that we're bringing in here is something we'll study further, but we really are referencing some of that industrial uh, past in the neighborhood and how do we move that forward to something here where you have some solid panels that start to shimmer in the light and bring some energy to the space. But a really exciting view up from that. Um, here's a, a section that moves from Halstead to Green to Peoria from right to left and you see the existing 167 on the right and that height transition from 15 to about 50 feet. Of course you have Green Street in the, the middle and then what we're really calling a plaza there in the heart of the building with a bridge floating above where we're getting you know a 70 feet clearance and then of course a view straight to the sky and then we come down to 18 feet as we move um, below the integrated parking, which is, uh, we have a little over 200 spaces there within that uh, parking segment and the office space above. We really want this to be a continuous space with 167 and, 70, and 170. And then here we're looking at a section from Randolph uh, to Lake. <clears throat> On the left, you see the scale of that historic building and our retail base start to relate in scale before it steps up to the amenity and office above. And of course, there's a section through um, that light well at the center, which is going to bring a lot of daylight to either side of the office, but also into the plaza itself. And now the, the ground plane, this is just a little more detail as we started to develop uh, some initial ideas about the, the landscape and the continuation of the muse on the right into our space. And one critical component will be having a crosswalk here with, you know, maybe it's a raised tabletop that starts to continue uh, the pave. And it won't be exactly the same thing as you see in the muse. It will have its own distinct character, uh, but you'll see a quality of uh, surface and activity of retail that link the two. Next slide, please. And this was just during the process of scale comparison to show both how it relates to the existing muse, but also a couple of projects that stood out for us, you know, a, a Midtown Plaza in DC, which is a great, uh, great space, as well as uh, Culver Plaza in California. So started to think about if those are spaces you've been, um, the kind of activity, both an office building, but also a public space, and how do we link those two together here within our, our space. So like the building massing itself, we studied a lot of different options and thought about how to activate that space and really felt like this organic flowing option that you see in the middle um, was a direction that we preferred. Keeping the, you can go to the next slide, please. So you, you see here some precedents for both uh, lighting in the space as well as some uh, landscape islands, uh, some really uh, 
interesting patterning within the texture of uh, the pavers themselves and how that space really comes out and meets uh, the sidewalk. So this will be a space that's really open to green and really inviting for everyone coming in. And you start to see some of those deeper uh, activities deeper in the site. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Just one more uh, closer view and then uh, a diagram of how some of those spaces, um, we intend those to work, but you have places for outdoor dining. And of course, tenants here may uh, expand upon uh, the seating that we have, but you'll always have this clear and open accessible path, path through the center uh, seating and landscape within it that we'll have to you know, carefully consider what that landscape is because we won't have a lot of direct light within the space. What we're trying to do with that is to create a lot of indirect light that comes down through that light well, uh, as well as, of course, direct light at uh, certain times of the year. We'll see that in a daylighting study a bit later. But if we think about, you know, how we're addressing the design guidelines here, we're really enhancing that uh, lower levels with uh, facade lighting, thinking about how to uh, identify and reveal those retail spaces and make sure we have very active uses, which, of course, is our goal here. Uh, we want this to be high quality paving materials and, you know, great site furnishings uh, within the space. Uh, we mentioned we, earlier that, you know, we are doing shadow studies and we use these to really place the two towers and make sure we were getting a lot of uh, south light to both the residential as well as the hotel. And uh, these locations ended up giving us the most uh, daylight on our upper level plaza. And then when it comes to sun exposure within the lower level plaza in the public realm, you know, it'll be more of a tracking of uh, the sunlight for a few hours and then creating some reflective surfaces with the glass and three dimensional panels to bring as much light as we can down into the space. I just wanna note that we've reached the 20 minute mark. So if you wanna take a few more minutes to wrap this up, that'd be great, thank you. Getting close, thank you. Uh, and then, you know, the facade itself, we're, we'll still be working on the details here, but if we think about a high performance uh, glazing and using solid panels to help us uh, reach uh, the energy code needs and using those solid panels again to articulate the facade changing scale, and we'll still be working through some different options on the exact uh, shape of those. But you move from something that's that folded metal panel, alternate from floor to floor to a multi-story expression uh, and then at the lower level, starting to create upper level balconies and enclosed spaces that can transform from winter to summer, uh, as well as some overhangs at the ground floor, which gives some protection from uh, the elements. Next slide, please. And we can walk through these quickly, but we're just going through a lower level plan, retail level with a little more detail. Next. Uh, the parking level and amenity level plan on the left, office level on the right, showing the location of the cores that you start to see uh, terrace and upper bridge levels. And then the hotel and residential floor, and of course, uh, the roof plan above. I just wanted to show both um, each of the elevations, south and east. And I think what you'll note there is that it really transforms from one elevation to the next when it comes to the massing. Um, and when it comes to sustainability, as we mentioned, we're really going to focus on creating a very uh, a wellness and sustainability focused building, uh, lead gold as a priority. And part of that high performance glass is um, thinking about how we can create a great environment inside that's comfortable without having to use shades and also helps us with energy performance. We have met and had several community meetings, uh, the West Central Association, West Loop Community Organization and West Loop. You see some of the notes here. We got some good feedback. I just got, got a pretty good uh, feedback on the scale and the kind of amenities and scale of the project uh, that we've been showcasing. Of course, there's some questions about traffic and congestion in the area, which we all have to deal with collectively. I won't go through all of those, but you're welcome to follow up with those. Next. And just, you know, in addition to those design guidelines, of course, there's uh, zoning compliance and we've listed a few of those here. You know, if you really, it's really all about reinforcing great urban features 
that make this building both part of the neighborhood uh, context, but standing out as something special that's moving the quality of design forward. And it was interesting here, you start to see these newer, taller buildings as part of the Chicago skyline at the upper levels and part of Fulton Market energy at the lower levels. So we're really trying to link those two together uh, within this project. Uh, of course, you see alignment with neighbors and really fitting in and that stepped massing that we've talked about many times. Um, of course, we didn't just start with this design. We had many iterations. <clears throat> These are a few of those, just a step back in time, both on uh, the massing location of the residential, the hotel, how those would address the streets, um, and also different facade uh, treatments, both in color, scale, um, and mass. And within these, we really tried to balance the, as we talked about, the urban context, uh, the viability of this project as a development. So of course, where these cores come through, how they relate to the other programs. And we really aligned around that, that first uh, design study that does the, did the best job of addressing all of those. Next slide. And finally here, just a summary with a couple of images, both that uh, contextual massing they see on the right and the uh, focus on the public realm at the ground level. Thank you very much. Um, Look forward to hearing your questions and comments. Tyler. Uh, committee members, please take a moment to review any comments received from the public in the Q&A box. I actually believe we have a few, mostly from Butler Adams, uh, and incorporate them however you see fit. The floor is now yours for comments and questions to the applicant. Again, please raise your Zoom hand and we will call on you. And I believe we have Andre first. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I do want to commend uh, the LJC team on a building that I think responds well to the context. Um, I really appreciate the massing, uh, the movement of the building, or I should say series of buildings. Um, it borrows from almost all the datum points uh, that are adjacent to the site, um, stepping from uh, the Hoxton Hotel, of course, 167, uh, and then stepping up eventually to Randolph. And I do also appreciate the idea of how you actually have uh, kind of, you know, uh, angled or kind of bowed uh, the hotel component to uh, the Nobu Hotel as well. Um, so I think, you know, from a massing standpoint, this is by far the superior <laughs> of the options that you uh, kind of just touched on toward the end of your, your presentation. Um, I also understood the um, resistance, at least at the ground level, from an urban design standpoint to, um, you know, not continue the muse from 167 straight through. Uh, you didn't want to compromise uh, the hotel or the office, I would assume, or I should say the office and the hotel component. Uh, and I think it's okay that it actually jogs, you know, and uh, I think the comment I have on that is that, you know, I think it puts some interesting pressure on that alley that's just to the north of 167. Uh, green that may have to be uh, another um, um, good urban design uh, issue that you may have to deal with or that the city may have to deal with to really kind of make this feel like this is part of a larger system. But uh, as it relates to just amassing uh, the building, the movement, you know, and also understanding the jogging of the views, which I think is just fine. I, I really think this is a, a, a well-designed building. I really do. Thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation. There is so much going on here. Um, I really commend you for taking on a lot of the issues that are swirling around this building, just in terms of the context of the neighborhood, the West Loop design, design guidelines, everything else. And this is quite a sizable parcel as well. Um, so I did want to talk a little bit about the West Loop design guidelines and the massing as it pertains to that. Um, there is a lot that we had to take in on the few slides that you articulated how you were meeting those design guidelines. And um, a lot of emphasis uh, was placed in the presentation of how this project links up with the other new building just east of here. Um, I would like to see more examination of how this building links with not just the new buildings, but also the historic district. 
Um, in particular, where I'm going with this is the larger building. And I think maybe page 47 shows it the best. Um, I think it's the residential building that is directly um, north of the Randolph buildings. That is the uh, shortest building, I believe on the, or no, the, the mid-sized building on the site. Yeah, here we go. Um, I would actually suggest that the shortest building should go behind the Randolph buildings and that it step up uh, towards the L tracks. Um, and I also had a question about the setback that I see, I believe that's an alley, like where the number two is on this slide, but that isn't an actual street, correct? Or is that a street there? That's an alley. Yeah, so I think the West of Guidelines look for setbacks off of streets, not alleys, um, to allow more light into the public way, if I'm not mistaken. And, um, so anyways, I would just ask that you work with DPD to study that a bit more. There was a lot going on. And I think that um, the West Loop guidelines, that was a process that was, I think, a year in the making. It took into comments from all the community groups. Um, so I think it's worth spending more time on that and to show a respect for that process and kind of address that a little bit more head on. Sure, we can we can take another look at that. There, you know, it's interesting looking at those because they're fantastic goals. Some of them do contradict each other, and so we've, we, you know, you have to really balance which ones we're following. But we'll we'll take another look, talk to the team, and we'll make this try to make this the best building we can. Eleanor, Andre. Yeah, actually, Eleanor reminded me of, of one question I did have for the design team, uh, and it is that uh, the um, edge where the loading is uh, on the uh, south side of the building. Could you talk a little bit more about how that would be treated architecturally and then also, you know, at least in the image that you have here, you know, how that massing is stepping down? Um, it would be good to understand how that is being treated architecturally. Well, you know, we just say that is a true alley uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, you know, with a lot of loading for the historic uh, buildings. And so we see this being, you know, at the lowest levels, a, a mostly solid uh, facade. And then as we step up, we're ensuring that we have uh, the spacing we need to have an all glass office and hotel component. You know, if you come too close to those uh to those buildings, it starts to impact the, uh, the amount of uh, glass that you can have there. So we were really, our goal was to create an angle that stepped away from the hotel and gave it some space for both uh, their rooms and our office. And then as you get to the lower buildings that the, the hotel and office components started to come out closer to the corner, uh, really defining that edge from the view from Randolph, uh, but also we just simply have some more space. So we tried to think about the space the building could fill as a three-dimensional thing, not just uh, you know, a plan or a certain level, but uh, the space for the building really changes as you move from the ground plane up. Uh, I hope that's helpful. Thank you. I believe Amanda, you are next. I thanks a lot for the presentation. Um, it dawned on me when you gave the your precedent uh, study, your kind of case studies for other um, structures that the palette that's kind of developing um, is definitely distinct to this zone. But then you talked a little bit later about um, maybe advancing some historic materials or some of the color palettes of some of the more historic um, elements and components that are in the vicinity. So I'm wondering, um, maybe not necessarily on the exterior at the scale of the larger massing, but when you're getting closer to the ground floor, you mentioned warm colors and warm materials, but is there a way to push a little bit more um, this kind of uh, transition or synergy between the, the kind of more industrial feel or uh, materiality of those historic materials with some of the things that you guys are doing. So I can see the ambition in the color palette, but the actual materials themselves, are there isolated moments or opportunities to bring in other kinds of materials that would, that would literally kind of um, reference those elements? Um, not in a completely kind of streamlined way, but in a way that might harken back to some of the proportions or the, or the uh, textures and materiality of those things. I could see that happening in some of the, the open spaces or plazas. And then my, my um, last kind of comment or question was about 
uh, what you're calling green space on these kind of elevated plazas. Looks like one is accessible, but is there thought about a variation in the way that you approach that related to whether it's um, the the hotel or the office or the residential towers? Is there any variation or delineation you guys are starting to think through? I know it's early on, but in terms of how you you might articulate that through the that kind of choice of um, green. I don't, I don't want to necessarily call it landscape, but kind of open space that you're working on. Those are both great comments. And maybe you could move the slide deck to uh, the ground floor plaza, one of those perspective views. Um, I, we really want to bring that some warmth and texture to the materials and especially think of the plaza itself, whether those are granite pavers or some of the wood pavers that you see um, across the street in the Muse and bring also some warmth to the materials here. So you're seeing some uh, wood soffits, vertical fins that may also be wood and we'll be evaluating a wood curtain wall at the ground floor, uh, as well as some of those um, uh, metal panels that come down and frame. In fact, that's a, a little bit older rendition of that, but it's something that will be the next layer of details of the skin uh, as we get down there. So I think that's really the next step of development, but we're also thinking about how this is, it's not just the facades, but the ground plane that references some of those historic things. And we definitely want this to move forward. This is not a building that's trying to replicate any of those things, but it might have some of the, the texture and color that I think you really articulated well. It, it both is inspired by the neighborhood, but it's moving it in a new direction. You know, there's, how can this bridge that uh, past and future within a space? And uh, I think that we'll continue to share where this evolves to. Um, one of the things I didn't mention as this has continued to uh, develop is that we're also gonna, in, you saw it in the plan, but on the right side, we'll have kind of an art wall or art gallery wall, which we're still developing. And the idea is to really engage um, artists as something that would change over time on this wall just behind the trees here. So that'll be another way that we're bringing more life and activity to uh, the space that we're developing. I think that was your first the question. Amenity deck level. Oh, the amenity deck level. Sorry about that. Um, to be frank, we haven't developed those as far as we have the ground planes. They're really focused on the public realm first, but we'll definitely have a differentiation among those. And you'll have shared amenity deck for the hotel and office that'll be accessible to both and a separate amenity deck uh, for the residents. And they'll definitely have different needs and it'll be a mixture of hardscape and uh, landscape spaces. And the idea is that you're, it's an interesting level because you're coming up just at the midpoint of a lot of buildings around. So really thinking about what's the difference in the view and the experience there, but you know, really that we see activity even from the ground in those spaces. And of course, there's also amenities on the top of the buildings where you'll have more hardscape, um, but we do hope to bring uh, some, uh, quite a bit of landscape to that uh, mid-level amenity deck. Okay. Thanks, Tyler. Uh, Jeannie, I believe you are next. There, I just had to find myself there um, to unmute. So um, thank you for the presentation. I, I'm less interested, I guess, personally in like these contextual nods to things that are, you know, in, in the neighborhood, because we all know this is like a whole new scale, a whole new, it's a brand new building. It is part of the future of the West Loop and just the future of Chicago. So the, the amount of um, program that you're bringing to it and all that, and the jobs that it will create and all of those things are really um, important. Um, I, so for, for me, the issue is really, like, I, I don't know why um, it has to be jogged this, this connection to the public space, number one, uh, maybe because these lots just don't line up. But um, um, when I think about the plaza and I see that um, it is covered substantially on the east side with the bridge, which is like a three-story high element. Um, and then I do, I do like the connection through the block. I just wonder as an architect, but without your developer hat on, what would you do? What would you do to improve the um, quality of that space? 
I'm not saying to add anything contextual to it. I just, I think from a massing standpoint, just do you have a response to that? Um, I'd like to hear how you, how that space might be improved for its comfort, its daylight, its, you know, its um, scale and so on. Um, that's one point if you could comment on it. And because it, it does feel like there could be improvement on there. Um, and second is, again, going back to really excited about the future of this part of the city and um, looking toward the future and the ambition of our, you know, of needing to respond to climate change. You mentioned a gold um, target, um, and but I would like to know maybe something just very basic about the solid to glass ratio and how you're achieve. I mean, um, just in in our climate, how one can achieve it if if you're if you are familiar with your solid to glass ratio. And then finally, just um, would like to know how you're responding to the issue of our city being, you know, um, on the Great Lakes and the, and the sensitivity to um, bird strikes on glass facades and how we, you're dealing with that challenge. So like kind of three, three questions. Yeah, those are all great. Uh, if I don't hit, hit them all, I will, you know, just please let me know. Um, you know, that connectivity to the past is more of a recent past, I would say here. And we're definitely looking through towards the future with the building. So it may have been overstated. I think there's, it's probably referenced in a little material uh, on the ground floor and some coloration of the building, but I would think there is a spirit to the infrastructure of Chicago. There are um, a lot of buildings that have taken on, whether it's uh, the color or the scale or the massing and this, we agree is not just it's it's really part of enriching Fulton Market at the ground plane, but it's part of our cityscape and thinking about how to be, you know, what's a great sustainable office building, what's a what's a great place to live, what's a great place to go out for dinner. Uh, all of those characteristics are driving uh, the design here. So I think uh, we'll definitely continue to push towards a future looking uh, building. That's definitely our goal. As far as the, the shape of the space here and the amount of light, I mean, really what we're trying to do is say there's a lot of success at 167 with the Muse with connectivity um, and energy as the retail starts to develop, but we've expanded the amount of space and the amount of access here greatly with creating a true light well. And there are a lot of uh, fantastic buildings that in Chicago that use that light well to bring a lot of light down. I mean, some of them, you know, it's even a covered space. And so I feel like we're uh, doing something a lot better than if we just covered the space like we have at 167. But we do want to continue to think about how how could the the forms of the solid panels within that start to reflect and bring more light down. That's one thing that we, we want to study. Um, and with the bridge, we did look at different heights for the bridge and we raised it up to try to bring more daylight in off of Green Street. So we'll continue to study those. Um, I think you see on the bottom of the bridge kind of a reflective surface. So we're really thinking about how we can create the most opportunity for light there. So that will be one thing that we do study as we continue to refine that. And again, I think you stated one of our goals um, and we may not be quite there yet, but we're definitely heading in that uh, direction. And when it comes to, um, you know, how we deal with the, the larger um, situation. I mean, it, it's a challenge when you're thinking about birds in urban environments. And uh, we are, you know, aware of the Lights Out initiative. And we're thinking about how we can make this facade as friendly as possible while still, you know, creating great space for the inhabitants inside. So I think that one's one where we'll still have to think about what our options are to address it. So it's in our minds, we probably will be part of the detail as we continue to develop the building. We've really focused as the presentation did today on getting the right mass, the right program relationships, thinking about how the cores worked within the building so it can really perform well. And our next level of development is gonna be taking all the details that you see here and really continuing to take those to the next level through mock-ups and actual material selections that uh, hopefully help us achieve all of those uh, goals that you just stated. Solid, solid to glass ratio. Oh, the solid to glass ratio. Uh, yeah, so with that question, I, we probably need more solid than 
we're showing now, but it's going to, we're going to balance that with uh, the needs of say an office tenant. And we're, we do as a team, both on the development and design side, feel like having some of those solid framed openings actually might be an advantage on the inside. People enjoy that sometimes giving more unique qualities to different portions of the building. So we see that as we start to get into a little deeper into energy modeling, that it may mean that the building has more of those solid panels. For instance, the residential area is another uh, portion of the building where we could really uh, accommodate those. So that's one of those details that we'll continue to to study. Um, thanks. I, I just want to just follow up on that because it's not exactly a detail because um, like the as we're trying to respond to the um, design, if we're looking at something that it isn't going to be, then it makes it hard for us to help, you know, with that com with that conversation. And I realize you need renderings and stuff for the finance or to to find the tenants and things like that. But but our role is supposed to really be to engage with you guys as a you know in a dialogue. Like what you know if you are going to make more solid, is it is it going to be um, like glass spandrel panels so it looks glass or you know what is the intention of the um, of the design where it's going? So that that's kind of where my question is going at, I know that you might not have the final thing, but the, the, this is like a new thing for us and for, you know, and for the development community to have us as a resource. And so we're trying to just get the dialogue more transparent out there and have it uh, so that we can really achieve excellence in our city. And, you know, and you guys are very talented designers. So, so that goes without saying, but it's really about this dialogue and that's what I feel like our responsibility is on this committee, not just to, you know, we're trying to just open that up and, and really um, talk about it so that our city can continue to lead in design and architecture. So um, that's really where that comes from. So um, just back to the, the, um, the one thing about the, the plaza and then I'll, I'll stop is just that to really, I was wondering if the if it, just more southern exposure would be beneficial as opposed to having a higher volume on the south side. But I, I realize it's it's difficult. But um, and that you can try to address it and ameliorate the lack of light in different ways. And I think it really could be a cool space. So I just wanted to um, challenge you to you know try to find ways to get more light in there. Yeah, thank you. Maybe, um, maybe, maybe the opening, um, and I'm sure you're going to do wind studies and things, but it, it could be also that the opening is higher going through all the way through the block as opposed to dropping it way down over there in the back of the plaza. So, because um, I think that you'll, you will find that the trees are, it's going to be hard to actually have trees, I think, in that space because of the, um, the nature of it. So, those are just some comments to to help as you move it forward. Yeah, those are great. And I, I will say that what we're showing on the exterior, just to answer your question, is the intention. And it will be more of a, uh, I think we're not too far off. We just, there is still study to be done uh, within the energy modeling as we move things around. But the goal is something very similar to what you see. And we're really actually excited about this conversation. And we do, we do want to be able to respond to the comments we hear here. So um, hopefully that's what you're... Yeah and hearing and we tried to really give you uh as a team all the drawings that are necessary to see where we're headed with with this you know so far it's been great feedback thanks thank you thanks tyler uh i do not see any other zoom hands up so uh i will go ahead yes okay we on Hi everyone. Just wanted to quickly, you know, just sort of, you know, um, confirm uh, the previous questions or, or comments from Jenny and others about the light aspect here. And I just want to see if you, can you show us a little bit more with this bridge and how the the height and what the functionality and how that's working from the program standpoint. And then. Um, you know, finally, I, I didn't hear much about, 
you know, how the landscape, I'm, I'm sure you're thinking about the types of material, plant materials that would work in this condition. Um, but I'm just, you know, concerned, are we gonna really have things that will ultimately thrive and grow in that location? And will it just become more hard and um, less welcoming from a pedestrian experience? So just wanted to understand the functionality behind the bridge. What is it connecting exactly? Um, and I see now it's four stories, is that right? Yes, uh, it's really creating a loop out of the office space. So, you know, we've got a larger office place that can um, work for, say, you know, a tech-oriented open office tenant, and that uh, loop creates a lot of connectivity on the floor plate there versus a, a U-shape. Um, and we really tried to think about, you know, what's the right amount of connectivity and slimming up that bridge to let more light in. And so those are the two things uh, that we're balancing. Uh, when it comes to the landscape below, I mean, we have the uh, LJC is also the landscape architect for the project, and uh, we do a lot of uh, these kind of urban spaces. And the amount of light quality that's getting down here is not as different as you would think, at least as far as the research we've done so far, as street shapes trees. So you're not going to have the flexibility to use all kinds of landscape. But if you think about uh, some of the street trees that thrive in urban shady environments on smaller streets, those are the kind of trees that work here. And you really have to think about planting at the lower levels that don't need direct sunlight at all. And there are, I mean, there are plants that work within direct light and those are the kind of plantings that we'll be using. And you can see here, we kept it pretty minimal as far as the amount of uh, plants there. That's not only driven by the amount of light, that's driven by this is gonna be a very active space, you know, maybe, uh, once we're fully back from COVID, up to 5,000 people coming here to work every day, more people moving through uh, the retail. And so we really want to make sure that, you know, this is a true urban space that's active with people directly connected to the street. So we need a lot of space for those activities and gatherings to happen. But it, it's a great point. We'll really focus on, um, you know, what kind of landscape can uh, thrive there. And that may take some experimentation. But definitely something we're thinking about. And the, the four floors for the bridge, that's occupiable. It's not just purely a bridge. There, you're, that's leasable space that's occupiable, or, or what do you? Go to the, uh, the floor plan for the uh, office level in the back. Yes, that's, it's actually a full you know, bay wide, 40, uh, 40 feet wide. So that's significant. I mean, that'll be planned office space. It's not just a uh, connector. Okay, thank you. Hi, um, I'm trying to work with one of our committee members on some technical uh, issues. Does anyone else have any comment? We have about five minutes left or so. Okay. I can make a couple of comments on, on the landscape side of things, um, Josh. Thank you. Yeah, I thought, you know, a few questions, but more than questions, I guess, uh, things to think about as you uh, review the design. Uh, for example, uh, we know that for this type of public, privately owned, publicly used uh, type of spaces, you know, when your ratio of active retail use in the ground floor is at least 50%, uh, then probably your space is going to work better. Um, there are uh, concerns about natural light um, that you can, you know, you can control uh, that by manipulating the angles and scale of uh, the bridge, for example. Looking at those will be useful. Um, diversity of seating and where the seating are located. Uh, the more seating that is uh, steps free, the better. Um, and a diversity of it, you know, uh, with the back, without the back, uh, movable, for commercial use, for fully public use, a diversity of those. And there are like ranges and percentages that you can uh, look at and try to run those through uh, the project and see how will you improve um, 
there will be um, also, I, I think it's important to also think of uh, guidelines for signage in all the kind of areas that are considered to be public spaces. Um, and then there are a, a whole lot of like, maybe it, maybe that's what's kind of, uh, will be in an interesting exercise to see what the guidelines are for, um, you know, preserving, making sure that at least 50% of uh, the frontage uh, in the sidewalks is free of obstacles. Um, see if you can improve the radio of street trees. Um, but those are common parameters uh, that I think it will be kind of useful to think of the landscape in that way as you move through the design development. Uh, do I have enough active? Uh, retail? Do I have enough diversity and quantity of seating? Am I as free of obstacles as I can? Am I allowing all the public, the natural light uh, that I can't? Um, but those will be the kind of um, key issues that come to mind looking at the drawings uh, that I think can be greatly improved. Thank you. I think that will end our discussion. Again, any committee members that may have other comments, please feel free to email them to me. Also, those that have commented, if you could email me your comments, again, just to make sure I have the most uh, accurate record, record of them, that would be well, great. Just by way of <laughs> I, oh, I just forgot to say something that was the most important thing I wanted to say was the role of public art also in the space. Every memorable, fabulous public space I can remember uh, welcomes in it uh, an expression uh, of art, art community. And it's a moment really to say something meaningful about uh, what these type of public spaces can can bring to the table and a collaboration with a collective of artists, well, that's up to you, but a collaboration with disciplines other than architecture and landscape architecture, I think it will be extraordinary. Uh, we couldn't agree more with that and that will definitely be a part of this space. All right, thank you. So before we adjourn, on behalf of DPD, thank you again for all of your critical thinking and thoughtful comments on these two important projects. The meeting will now move into a private session to allow committee members to further advise the commissioner and his staff. We will now take a 10 minute recess and reconvene at 3.36. Members of the public and development teams, please depart the Zoom meeting at that time. Thank you for attending and sharing your thoughts. We hope you'll come back soon. Thank you.